All right, thanks, Titus. Good evening, everyone. Could you turn your Bibles to Daniel chapter 8, verse 1? And you should have, of course, my translation in front of you of that chapter, Daniel chapter 8. <clears throat> We're going to wrap up our studies in Daniel this week with a, a study of verse 19, uh, where Gabriel, remember Gabriel was uh, just about to um, uh, give us the uh, interpretation of the vision, and we'll find this evening that Gabriel tells Daniel here in verse 19 that the vision that he received from God foreshadows events during the righteous indignation related to the end because it extends to an appointed time related to the end. So as I've been pointing out, <clears throat> this expression, these expressions here in verse 19 about the end, the references to the time of the end, and also the one in verse 17 is telling us that this vision has not only uh, been fulfilled in history by Antiochus Epiphanes IV, but it's actually foreshadowing Antichrist will be in the future because he'll be living during the time of the end during Daniel's 70th week. So remember, foreshadowing and being the, the, the fulfillment of a prophecy are two different things. So uh, Antichrist is just uh, being foreshadowed by Antiochus Epiphanes in this vision. Antiochus Epiphanes IV actually foreshadowed, uh, actually uh, fulfilled the vision here of the small horn in Daniel chapter 8. So we'll be talking a little bit about, uh, again, Daniel's 70th week as, uh, this evening. And uh, remember in... Uh, and we're almost uh, not too long, uh, not too far from now. We'll, about another month, we'll be in Daniel chapter nine, and uh, we'll be that'll be the great uh, that chapter contains the great uh, prophecy of the seventy weeks of Daniel. We call it actually in the Hebrew, it just means the seventy sevens. And uh, so we'll be uh, have a lot to cover uh, here this evening. Remember, we have a prayer meeting at the end of class as well as as, as is the the case on Thursday evenings. So. Uh, as we uh, look around, let's uh, take a moment of silent prayer to examine ourselves and to uh, determine if we need to confess any sin to the Father if we haven't done so already, to ensure the fact that we're in fellowship with God and we worship God by means of the Spirit and truth. As Jesus taught the woman at the well in John's Gospel, chapter 4. And uh, so we, the first step is to confess our sins, do what 1 John 1, 9 states. And then uh, once our, we've been restored to fellowship, we bring our thoughts into obedience to the Spirit who speaks to us to the teaching of the Word of God. That's when we're uh, maintaining that filling of the Spirit which is commanded to us in Ephesians 5.18. And of course that's synonymous with letting the Word of Christ richly dwell in, in our, our souls. So with our heads by and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day, another day and another week of uh, Bible teaching. We thank you for the giving us the great privilege of learning your, your word, learning your will for our lives. We thank you for the gift of the Spirit and the completed canon of Scripture. We thank you, Father, uh, for uh, placing us in union with your Son and giving us the victory over sin and Satan and help us to appropriate by faith our position in Christ and to consider ourselves dead to the sin nature and alive to you. Help us to see that we already have the victory over sin and Satan. It's been accomplished through, both your, through your son's death on the cross and his resurrection. And now uh, the Holy Spirit, because he's united us with your son uh, through the baptism of the Spirit, now that we, we are, now have the victory positionally over sin and Satan in his cosmic system. So help us to walk by faith and not by sight. Walk by faith in what the Word of God says, not what our emotions say or science has to say, or philosophy, or the, the, just the commentators of the world, all the voices out there, help us to shut these things out and to realize that uh, the truth resides with you. And so help us, Father, to uh, see the reality of uh, the sufficiency of Scripture and that the Scriptures can solve all of our problems. And we thank you, Father, for the things we've been learning in the book of Daniel and the fact that you're sovereign, you're omnipotent, and you're omniscient, and we pray, Father, that learning all, thing, all these things will draw us closer to you, that it will compel us to, to walk by faith in your word and turn to you to solve our problems and difficulties and adversities and even dealing with prosperity. Father, we thank you for the Thompsons opening up their home tonight to us, and we thank you for their sacrifice. We thank you for Titus' service. 
with the recordings and the uh, and the, and the upload of the video and Tyler's work there too. Uh, we just thank you, Father, for them. We thank you, Father, for those who might be viewing this class or listening to it through internet radio, or Pal Talk, or TeamSpeak. We pray that everyone in the audience would receive their necessary spiritual nourishment. We pray that you would help everyone to be sensitive to what the Spirit is saying to us this evening through the teaching. We just pray that you would help everybody to concentrate and to make the proper application. And we just pray, Father, that they would uh, grow in their love for your word, which reveals your character and nature and, our, and your will for our lives. We also pray that you would give me grace and give me the, the strength to bring forth uh, your word, your full counsel to your people, uh, and that I could be your instrument this evening and that the Spirit would be manifested through me and so that uh, the body of Christ would be built up and edified spiritually and your Son would, and yourself would be magnified. Father, we thank you so much again and praise you for, for who and what you are and who and what your Son is in the Spirit and what you've done for, for us in the past through them and are doing for us now and will do for us in the future. In our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Daniel chapter 8, verse 1. If you could read along with me my, with my translation. Of course, you could read along with your Bibles as well. Uh, so uh, it says in verse 1, Daniel chapter 8, During the third year of Belshazzar's reign, the king of vision appeared to me. I, Daniel, after the one appeared to me previously. Indeed, I was staring because of this vision. Specifically, I was myself in a trance-like state staring as I myself was in Susa, the citadel, which was in the province of Elam. Furthermore, I was staring because of this vision as I myself was beside the Ulai Canal. Then I lifted up my eyes, and then I was staring as, behold, a ram was standing in front of the canal with it possessing two horns. Furthermore, the two horns were long. However, one was longer than the other, with the longer one growing up last. I saw this ram continually budding westward as well as northward, and in addition southward as all the beasts could by no means stand in front of it. Furthermore, none could deliver out from its power, so that it acted according to its desire. Indeed, it became great. Then I myself was in a trance-like state, as behold, a male goat, who was ruler over the goats, was traveling from the west over the earth's surface. In fact, it was not touching the earth's surface. Also, this male goat had a conspicuous horn between its eyes. Next, it traveled up to the ram, possessing two horns, which I saw standing in front of the canal. In fact, it charged against it in a powerful rage. Consequently, I saw it wage an attack, opposing this ram, while causing itself to become enraged against it. Indeed, it repeatedly struck this ram, so as to shatter its two horns. Also, there was no ability in the ram to stand in front of it. Then it drove it to the ground, as well as trampled on it repeatedly. Indeed, to the detriment of the ram, there was none who could deliver from its power. And so, this, so the male goat, who was the ruler over the goats, was very great. However, as soon as, it be, as soon as it became powerful, the unusual horn was broken. Then in its place, four conspicuous ones arose towards the heavens' four winds. Next, from one of them, a small horn in comparison, emerged, which grew excessively large towards the south, as well as the east, and in addition, the beautiful land. Specifically, it grew larger than the heavens' host, Indeed, it caused some of this host, yes, some of these stars, to fall to the earth. Also, it trampled on them. It even presented itself as great as the host's commander while taking away the daily sacrifice from him so that his holy place was abandoned. Consequently, the host, along with the daily sacrifice, were delivered over to it through transgression. Also, it caused the truth to be thrown to the ground. Indeed, it executed, yes, it succeeded. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and a holy one said to this particular one who was speaking, How long is the vision, the daily sacrifice, specifically the transgression making desolate, resulting in delivering over both the sanctuary as well as the host to be trampled? Consequently, he said to me, For 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary will be reconsecrated. Now, I was in a trance-like state staring at this vision, which I, Daniel, desired to understand is, behold, one like a man in appearance was standing directly in front of me. Then I heard a human being's voice between the banks of the Uli. Indeed, it ordered and said, Gabriel, enable this one to understand the vision. Therefore, he approached my location. Indeed, when he approached, I was terrified so that it fell upon my face. Then he said to me, Please understand, descendant of Adam, that the vision extends to the end time. 
Now, while he was speaking with me for my benefit, I was caused to enter the state of being in a deep sleep with my face to the ground. However, he touched me so that he caused me to stand upon my feet. Now, what we have here is the, the, this particular vision is in a, in a couple of uh, parts, different, uh, uh, different uh, scenes. Uh, first of all, we have the appearance of the, the, the goat, and the male goat and the ram, the ram appearing first, uh, Gabriel's interpretation. If you look at, uh, uh, you can read along with me in your Bibles. I'm going to read off the New American Standard. But let's look at the, the interpretation by Gabriel's, which will be st beginning next week. It says in verse 20, the ram which you saw with the two horns represents the kings of Media and Persia. The shaggy goat represents the kingdom of Greece. And the large horn that is between his eyes is the first king. The broken horn and the four horns that arose in its place represent four kingdoms which will arise from his nation, although not with his power. In the latter period of their rule, when the transgressors have run their course, a king will arise, insolent and skilled in intrigue. His power will be mighty, but not by his own power. And he will destroy to an extraordinary degree and prosper and perform his will. He will destroy mighty men and the holy people. And through his shrewdness, he will cause deceit to succeed by his influence. And he will magnify himself in his heart, and he will destroy many while they're at ease. He will even oppose the prince of princes, but he will be broken without human agency. The visions in the, of the evenings and the mornings, which has been told, is true. But keep the vision secret, which is a bad translation, basically means to seal it up, for it pertains to many days in the future. So... Uh, the, the prophecy is pretty, uh, for, the, for the most part, is pretty cut and dry. Uh, we see uh, Medo Persia, uh, they're the, represented by the ram, the, uh, the, the, the first ram that shows up with the two horns. And then the uh, male goat is Greece, and the conspicuous horn between the eyes of the male goat is the first king of Greece, which we know is, through history is Alexander the Great. So this has all been fulfilled. And then he dies, He's, that's the, the idea with the broken horn. And then in his place, rises up four kings and that's uh, for referring to in history Alexander's four generals who divided up his empire all fulfilled in history and then it says from one of these kings comes one who'll be an insolent king and shrewd and, and uh, persecute God's people uh, that it tell, uh, history tells us was Antiochus Epiphanes the fourth because we know that everything that Gabriel says in verses 23 through 26 uh, Antiochus Epiphanes IV, his character and actions against the Jewish people and against the God of Israel is, uh, his, uh, fits this particular description of the small horn here in Daniel chapter 8. So this has all been fulfilled in history. However, as we pointed out last uh, uh, in the several past evenings, and in particular verse 17, and we're going to note in more detail tonight, Gabriel mentions the latter period. He, ends, he talks about the end times. Uh, and that's a reference to Daniel's 70th week, the last seven years of Israel's prophetic history. That, so therefore, that's telling us that Gabriel, and of course, God the Holy Spirit's uh, uh, speaking through Gabriel, is telling us, yes, the vision, and, and, and that we would only know this in the 21st century, and the people during Daniel's 70th week will know this. Daniel wouldn't have known this. But we know, because all this time of history has taken place, all this history before us has taken place, and Antiochus Epiphanes has fulfilled this, Gabriel, uh, we mentioned of the end time here, three times in verses 17 and, and 19, is telling us that God wants us to look at this vision, not only as being fulfilled with Antiochus Epiphanes IV, but to look at it as his, Antiochus Epiphanes IV is a, is a type of the Antichrist to come, who will be a Roman dictator from the Roman Empire, and he'll live during the final uh, seven years of Israel's prophetic history, the, 70, 70, uh, the 70th week of Daniel. So that's all future. So this is what we have here in the vision. It's a, 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 it's, I, I, don't, I don't see too many visions in those scriptures, and I can't think of one off the top of my head that's quite like this particular vision. It's been fulfilled in the second century BC with Antiochus, but the, the references to the time of the end are telling us that Gabriel wants us to look at this uh, this. Uh, uh, listen to his interpretation and think of somebody who's coming uh, in the end time that will be like Antiochus Epiphanes the fourth. But in fact, he's actually be worse. So why is why does God want us to know this? Why did, why does God spend so much time on this small horn, this king, Antiochus Epiphanes? Because Daniel wrote this was written. This was given to Daniel in the sixth century BC. God wanted to prepare the Jewish people and in particular the ones who had lived during Antiochus's time for this particular king. 
And many understood the prophecy in Daniel chapter 8 when Antiochus Epiphany showed up because he was fulfilling all these things. And they were encouraged because they knew that his time would come to an end. And in fact, we saw that uh, the woman with her seven ch uh, children uh, who were put to death by Antiochus and the last one rebuked Antiochus and told him that he would be judged by God and he was. So we have the events here in chapter 8 in this vision of the small horn took place from 171 B.C. to 164, 163 B.C. around those, that area. It was 2,300 literal days beginning with Antiochus' invasion of Israel ending with his death. So this has been fulfilled in history. However, what we see in verse 19 is telling us, in verse 17, and this references to the time of the end, says God wants us to look at this king as foreshadowing a, a wicked king uh, in the future, namely uh, anti Antichrist. So God wants the pe this is for the benefit of people living not only for us now here in the church age, so we know this, but also it's for the benefit of the people who are going to be living during Daniel's 70th week uh, to know this and know what to I the marks that identify the Antichrist and they'll be looking at chapter 8 during the tribulation period they'll see chapter 8 they'll see chapter 9 they'll see chapter 7 they'll read the book of Revelation they'll have a great they'll say this is the guy who is fitting the bill here and uh, so that it's God's given him enough information why because it's very very important because his son is going to set up his kingdom during the reign of this final wicked tyrant world ruler Antichrist that's why it's so much emphasis is being pay, uh, paid to this particular uh, character, the Antichrist, in the sense that he's being for, uh, uh, he's mentioned in chapters uh, seven of the book of Daniel, Revelation uh, thirteen in particular. Uh, he's also in seventeen, also Daniel chapter nine. He's referenced in Daniel nine twenty seven, and of course Daniel chapter eight. He's being foreshadowed by Antiochus Epiphanes the fourth. So look at Daniel chapter eight verse nineteen, and I'm reading from. Uh, the New American Standard at this point. Be, he, and Gabriel says to Daniel, Behold, he said, Behold, I'm going to let you know what will occur at the final period of the indignation, for it pertains to the appointed time of the end. Now, when he says behold, that's an interjection in the Hebrew. It's the word hene. And this particular word is drawing the, is, is designed to draw the attention of us, the reader, to this statement made by Gabriel. By, and, uh, because Gabriel wants us to understand how important, uh, Dan, when he says behold, he's trying to emphasize with Daniel and the reader how important this is. Because what he says in this verse is going to give us a clue as to the fact that not only is this going to be fulfilled in history, but it's also going to foreshadow somebody during the end times Antichrist, the two, especially the two statements about the uh, final period of the indignation and the appointed time of the end. So, w also this word "behold," hene, it means it's uh, the statement. Uh, this uh, particular word "behold" is marking out this statement by Gabriel as a impressive and astounding to Daniel, and uh, it, it 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 threw him for a loop. Now, don't miss this. Daniel didn't when he got this vision. He wasn't too sure what this was all about. Uh, he remember he's in the sixth century BC. He doesn't know what we know. We're on the other side of history than he is. We've seen this fulfilled in history by Antiochus Epiphanes the fourth. He's trying. He's 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 looking at this probably uh, uh, thinking of the small horn of chapter seven because of the the evil that's uh, being uh, 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 committed by this small horn in Daniel chapter eight. However, they're two different personages, and again, the one in chapter eight is foreshadowing the Antichrist. Uh, the Roman dictator in Daniel's 70th week. Now, when he says, I'm going to let you know, that's indicating that Gabriel is telling Daniel that he's about to cause him to know what will occur during the pe final period of wrath because the vision extends to the appointed end time. Now, what's this phrase? At the final period of the indignation. In the Hebrew, it's a prepositional phrase. We have the preposition baith, which is translated here at, and then the word akarith, which is translated the period of. And then we have the noun za'am, which is the word translated indignation. I, 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 don't, I, I, I like that translation. The word akarith, it means the end, the latter time, the latter end, later in time it can mean, because it refers to the last point of a period of time. This word that's translated in your Bibles, the, uh, the uh, akarith, the period of, it's speaking of uh, something that's the, a latter time, 
the end, the latter end, because it's it's referring to a last point of a period of time. Now, this is connected to Daniel's 70th week. Because Daniel's 70 weeks of Daniel give the prophetic history of Israel. It's 490 prophetic years of Israel's history. 480 or three of which we've already seen fulfill in history. We're waiting for the last seven years, which is yet future. That last seven years is what Gabriel is referencing here. Of course, Daniel doesn't know too much about this, but we do because we have more revelation than Daniel. Now, the word za'am, it means, as I said before, I like the translation, it, can mean, it means wrath or righteous indignation because it refers to a curse that expresses extreme indignation. It's speaking of the, the wrath of God, the righteous indignation of God, which we're going to talk a little bit about tonight. Now, the articular construction of this noun, articular means it has an article before it. The article in English is the. In Hebrew, it has different nuances. It can do different things. In the Greek, they can do a whole lot of different things, the, the, the article. Here, the articular construction of this word za'am, indignation, it indicates that this latter period is very important. This latter period of wrath is a unique period of history. The articular construction is telling us the Hebrew reader, okay? And my job is to tell you what it says. And so, th- so you know what the original audience was uh, understood it as. It's a unique period of history. Okay, it's not just any old period of history. It's a unique period of history. Nothing like it. Now, the const- construct state of the noun, akarith, means that it's governing the, the uh, noun, za'am, indignation. And this is expressing a genitive relation when you have a construct state. And... Uh, the genitive relation here is possession. So that indicates that this wrath or righteous indignation, that is unique. It belongs to or is related to the latter time or the end. The end of what? At the, the end of Israel's prophetic history. I mean, in a sense, prior to the, the, the millennial reign of Christ being set up. Now, the construct state signifies a relationship between the end and this wrath or righteous indignation. Now, the word akarith, the period of... It's also the object of the preposition baith, as I pointed out, which is translated here at. It actually means during. And the reason why is because it's a marker of an extended time within a larger unit of time. So this indicates that Gabriel is telling Daniel that he's about to cause him to know what will take place during the righteous indignation or the wrath of the end. Now, this prepositional phrase indicates that the events symbolically portrayed in the vision will take place uh, during the righteous indignation of the end. In, in, a, in, a, in a foreshadowing sense, I need to qualify that. Now, the phrase, for it pertains to the appointed time of the end. The it is a reference to the vision, of course. That's presenting the reason why, or the basis, for which the events symbolically portrayed in the vision will take place during the righteous indignation belonging to the end. Now, let me give you my translation of verse 19. There's not much uh, I needed a, a tweak with the translation uh, there, so we didn't have too much Hebrew there. Look at verse 19. Then he said, Behold, I'm about to cause you to know, Daniel, what will take place during the righteous indignation related to the end, because the vision extends to an appointed period of time related to the end. So once he revives Daniel, Gabriel, the elect angel of God, who stands in the presence of God, tells Daniel that he's about to cause him to know what will take place during the righteous indignation related to the end. He then proceeds to give him the reason as to why these events symbolically portrayed in the vision will take place during the righteous indignation related to the end, or the wrath related to the end. They will take place at that time because the vision extends or covers an appointed period of time related to the end. So therefore, the phrase, the end time in verse 17, as well as the end and the appointed period of time related to the end, here in verse 19, are a reference to the end of Israel's prophetic history prior to the second advent of Jesus Christ in his subsequent millennial reign, namely Daniel's 70th week. So these phrases here in verse 19 and 17 are all a reference to the last seven years of Israel's prophetic history, which Bible scholars call Daniel's 70th week. Thus the events, very important, the events that we see symbolically portrayed in the vision here in verse uh, chapter 8 of the book of Daniel are foreshadowing symbolically 
what's going to take place during Daniel's 70th week. So it's pertaining to the final time of indi indignation of Israel's particular of history. So let me uh, go, let's go over, we're going to be doing this in detail. Let's take a peek over at Daniel chapter 9 again and look at verse 24. Because this is going to be key, because we got to know what the time of the end he's talking about here in verse 19. Where is he talking about? Well, in the next chapter, Gabriel is going to tell Daniel what this time of the end is a reference to. In fact, Daniel's got probably has a, I, I think Daniel has a, probably an idea what the time of the end is because of the, the visions he got in chapter 2 and chapter 7. Because he doesn't even mention the second advent of Christ in both visions, where God sets up his kingdom on the earth. Yes, he does. The rock smashing the feet of the statue, speaking of Christ's second advent and filling the earth his millennial reign, and then the destruction of, uh, of, the, um, of the small horn in chapter 7, and God setting up his reign through the Son of Man on earth, his kingdom on earth through the Son of Man, and that passage in Daniel chapter 7, yes. So I think Daniel has an a little a hint, I think, of the time of the end, but it's really spelled out in the 70 weeks of Daniel. So let's first look at, uh, uh, in fact, uh, hold, uh, hold your place in Daniel chapter 9. Look at Daniel chapter 2 real quick. Look at the very end of the chapter. Daniel chapter 2, look at verse 44. We have the time of the end mentioned here. But it's not explicitly mentioned as the time of the end. We can see that it's, it's definitely the time of the end because of what other passages say in the Bible. In verse 44, Daniel 2, 44, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed and that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will self endure forever. That's the time, that will happen in the time of the end which D Gabriel's referencing here. And then, uh, in fact, if you look at... Uh, uh, bu 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 look at uh, yeah, look at uh, Daniel two thirty five. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all crushed all at the same time, and uh, it became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, so that not a trace of them was found. But the stone that struck the statue, that's Christ, in his second advent, became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Okay. So that's, that's speaking of the, the time of the end. Christ, the, the time of the end, Daniel's 70th week, what ends it? The second advent of Christ. Then that's followed by the millennial reign in history. That's what, he, that's, that's what he's referencing. So prior to the second advent of Christ, those last seven years are the reference the end time. And Jesus' second advent t uh, culminates that end time. Now look at Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, verse 27, Then the sovereignty, the dominion, and greatness of all the kingdoms and the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all the dominions will serve and obey him. That's speaking of the millennial reign of Christ. But he, he goes and he, in, in verse 26, But the court will sit for judgment, and his dominion will be taken away, annihilated, and destroyed forever. Who's that? The, the, the small horn represents Antichrist. God's going to destroy him. How's he going to destroy him? The rock striking the feet of the statue. What's that referring to? The second advent of Christ. So now look at Daniel chapter 9. So there's a little, intimate, a little uh, uh, indications of the time of the end in those two chapters. Look at Daniel 9.24. Here's the explicit one here. Because now, the 70 weeks of Daniel are a reference to the uh, four, their 490 prophetic years of Israel's history. So they're not literal week. A week in this prophecy is not seven days. And I'll show you why. Look at it, Daniel. It says Daniel 9.24. 70 weeks have been decreed for your people. In fact, it says 77s in the Hebrew, literally. 70 weeks have been decreed for your people. Not the, not the church. It's Israel. And your holy city, Jerusalem. The church doesn't have a holy city, although they like to say it's Jerusalem, but it's the Jewish people here. We are a heavenly citizenship. To make an end, it says, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, that's all at the cross, to bring an everlasting righteousness, the millennial reign of Christ, to seal up vision and prophecy, fulfill the, the second advent, and to, in the millennial reign, and to anoint the most holy place. 
So you were to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, that decree was Artaxerxes Longamanus in 444 BC. That marked the decree. And we'll tell, we'll, when we get to it, we'll go into detail because there are different decrees around that period and which one was it? And I'll show you why which, this one was the correct one. So uh, right now I just want to go through this and get you get a general idea of this. I'm not trying to prove everything I interpret here. Verse 25, so you to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to de restore and rebuild Jerusalem, all mentioned in Nehemiah and Ezra, until Messiah, Jesus Christ, the Prince, there'll be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So the seven weeks are referring to for, uh, are referring to seven times seven is 49 years. That's what it's speaking of. Seven times seven. And so we have, uh, we have uh, he says, to, until Messiah the Prince, uh, there'll be seven weeks, and then there'll be 62 weeks. 62 weeks is 434 years in this prophecy. Put them together, they're 483 years. Okay? So that would lead us all the way up to the, to the uh, Jesus introducing himself as the Messiah. They rejected him by crucifying him. So then it says, in, uh, so in verse 25, so you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there'll be seven weeks and 62 weeks. And it will be built again. Now, why does he break it up? Now, that's, that's a good question I always ask myself. Why did he just say uh, the, uh, the um, 69 weeks? Why does he break it out into 47 uh, weeks and then 62 weeks? Or in other words, 49 years and 434 years. Why would he do that? Why don't they just say 483 years, bud? Why, not, why does he do that? Why didn't he say 69 weeks, 483 years? The reason why is because there's something happening in those seven, uh, 49 years and there's something happening in the, 60, uh, the 434 years. That's why he breaks it out. So then it says, it will be built again. What will be? Jerusalem. With plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Check out Ezra in the book of Nehemiah. It chronicles this whole thing. Verse 26. Then after the 62 weeks, and remember, don't get freaked out or uh, faked out by that. You got to still add this. The, 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 uh, you, still have to, you still have to add those seven weeks that was mentioned at the beginning. So this would be after 483 prophetic years of Israel's history, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, would be cut off. This was literally fulfilled right to the day, okay? This whole prophecy, it's amazing. And have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now, this is going to tell us that he's a Roman. We already, the Antichrist is a Roman. We already know that. We already know that from uh, the, uh, chapter 7 because he comes from the Roman Empire, the small horn. This is another passage that tells us this. Who's the people who destroyed the city and the sanctuary? Who's the, what's the city? Jerusalem. What's the sanctuary? The temple. Herod's temple. Now, who is the people? The Romans did this in 70 AD. It's been fulfilled in history. Now, notice it says, the prince who is to come. Where does he come from? From the people who destroyed the city and the sanctuary. So it's a, he's a Roman. Antichrist is going to be a Roman. So then he says, and it's, and so in its end, will come with a flood, Jerusalem, and even to the end, there'll be war and desolations are determined. All fulfilled in history. You could read uh, Josephus, and he talks, it's called the War of the Jews, and he chronicles this terrible period in Israel's history. Israel, Israel gets exiled into uh, Jeru uh, to Rome, and actually, there's on, and you can go to Rome today, and you can see the Arch of Titus, and it has a depiction of the Roman captives coming in, and they even have the menorah, the golden menorah, and the articles of the temple with them. And those were all sold off. They're all somewhere in Rome, somewhere in Europe, those things, by the way probably somewhere in Europe, or maybe they were all destroyed by now, who knows. But they all ended up in Europe, all that stuff. I'm sure everybody's probably written out, let's go find that stuff, you know. You, you know we get that, they should do a movie on that with uh, Tom Hanks instead of making that crazy stuff he makes. Uh, then look at verse 27. Now, the prophecy, uh, we can see, because of verse 27 hasn't been filled yet in history, that, me, that we're right in between verses 26 and 27. Okay? Because this prophecy, when you t in relation to history, it's not contiguous. You know what I mean? It's not one thing after the other. There's, a, there's an intercalation, we call it, an insertion, us, the church age, between those two verses. Now look at verse 27. And he, who's this guy? He, there's, a, <laughs> there's more articles and scholarly articles written on that particular pronoun. You wouldn't believe it. He, that's speaking of the Antichrist, the, the, the prince who is to come, who's from the Romans. He will make a firm covenant with the many. Who's the many? Israel, the leaders of Israel. For one week, 
That's the 70th week. What's one week? It's seven years. And for one week, but in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. Who does that sound like? Antiochus Epiphanes IV, right? Doesn't that sound like chapter 8? Antiochus Epiphanes did that too. Antichrist is going to do this. That's why you know, that's why Gabriel's telling us he's foreshadowing Antiochus is of chapter 8, the small horn of chapter 8. He's, in, he's, he's foreshadowing, he's pointing, he's a type of the Antichrist who is yet to come, who's being mentioned here. So this is what Antichrist is going to do in the future, paralleling what Antiochus the Epiphanes the fourth did in the second century BC. And on the wing of abominations, Daniel 11, 21 through 35 mentions Antiochus doing the same thing sacrificing a sow, that was an abomination, and desecrating the temple, and then putting up a, 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 a worship of Zeus in the temple. That's an abomination of desolation. The difference between Antichrist's abomination and desolation and Antiochus is that Antichrist is going to put up a worship of himself. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed is poured out on the one makes, who makes desolate. Basically, he's going to be destroyed. By who? The Lord. The rock that strikes the, fi the, the feet of the statue. The son of man of chapter 7. Now, notice there, that's all the time of the end right there. That verse is speaking of the time of the end in relation to Israel's prophetic history. Now, you say the 70 weeks of Daniel. How come they're not literal, how come they're not literal days? S well, think about it. Could all the, for instance, you take verse 25 you take the time where Israel was, the temple was rebuilt all the way to the crucifixion of Christ, 444 B.C., all the way to, to 33, BC, uh, 33 A.D. It couldn't be literal day, uh, weeks, seven days in a week because there's not enough time. That's not enough time for all these events to be fulfilled. But if, they're, if a week is seven years, it's fulfilled right exactly to the day. So the events that are, are, are recorded here in these verses, in verses 25 and 26 and 27, uh, it couldn't be, the prophecy could be a week, and the prophecy couldn't be a literal seven-day week. It has to be seven years for a week because of the, there's, there's too many, the, the events wouldn't fit all into, in, in, into the prophecy then. Here's another thing. Look at Daniel chapter 10. Look at it says... In Daniel chapter 10, verse 3. Now, you can only know this if you knew, if you saw the Hebrew. I'm going to bring it out to you. I'm going to bring it out to you because you can't see it in your English Bibles. You might want to write a note in this. It says in Daniel 10, 3. This is right on the heels of chapter 9, right? And he's talking about weeks. Look at what it says in verse 3. I did not eat, Daniel, Daniel says, any tasty food, nor did meat or wine enter my mouth, nor did I use any ointment at all until the entire three weeks were completed. Now, it, what's, how, is that seven years? No. How do you know, Bill? You just make it off the top of your head? No. In the Hebrew, it says in the Hebrew, three sevens of days. Of days is key because of days, three seven of days is what the Hebrew literally reads. But if you go over to Daniel chapter 7, or Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, it says 70 weeks, there's no of days after it. That's, cons that's, con that's conspicuous. That's because Daniel wants you to know there's a difference between the two. The one in verse 3 of chapter 10, it's literally in the Hebrew, three sevens of days. In Daniel 9, 24, there's not 70 weeks of days. That's telling us that Daniel doesn't want us, or Gabriel doesn't want us to think the 70 weeks are literal. A week is a literal seven-day period. He wants us to think of it in something else. Here's the other thing. In Daniel 9.2, look at Daniel 9.2. In the first year of his reign, who's this? Darius. I, Daniel, observed in the books of the number of the years, which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet for the completion of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. That also is telling us that the 70 weeks of Daniel are years, not days. Prophetic years here. Because the, the, the prophecy is, he's taught, he, it causes him to pray is the prophecy with Jeremiah who talks about 70 years Israel will be sent to Babylon because they didn't observe their Sabbaths. That's among other things they didn't do. So there we have 
Uh, so, so what we have here is these are different reasons why, and there are more. I don't want to get too bogged down on it, but those are different reasons why the 70 weeks are not referring to a week is not, in that prophecy, the 70 weeks is not a, a, a speaking of weeks in terms of seven days, but in seven years. A week is seven years. So this was the whole prophetic history of Israel in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. Seven years are yet future. Prophetic years of Israel's history. That's seven years. That's yet future. When Antichrist will be walking this earth, that's what Gabriel's talking about in Daniel 8, 19 and Daniel 8, 17 about the time of the end. So go back to Daniel 8, 19. So in Daniel 8, 19, it says, Then he said, Gabriel said to Daniel, Behold, I'm about to cause you to know what will take place during the righteous, righteous indignation related to the end, because the vision extends to an appointed period of time related to the end. The end of what? Well, now we know. That's Daniel's 70th week. So what we have here is a... Uh, is a a, a reference to the Daniel 70th week with those uh, t references to the time of the end. Now, the ram, and uh, what we see here is that the phrase, the end time in Daniel 8, 17, as well as the end and the appointed period of time related to the end here in verse 19, are a reference to the end of Israel's prophetic history prior to the second advent of Jesus Christ in his subsequent millennial reign, namely Daniel's 70th week. So these phrases... And verses 17 and 19 are all, uh, all uh, uh, the, uh, these phrases are all a reference to the last seven years of Israel's prophetic history, which Bible scholars call Daniel's 70th week. Some people call it tribulation period. Some people call it Jacob's trouble because that's one of the phrases for it. And thus the events here in chapter 8 of the book of Daniel, symbolically portrayed in the vision, are foreshadowing wrote symbolically what will take place during Daniel's 70th week. Now, the ram in verses 3 and 4, as we saw, was fulfilled in history by the Medo Persian Empire. History teaches that the male goat in verses 5 through 8 was fulfilled by the Greek Empire, and the conspicuous horn represented Alexander the Great. The four conspicuous horns represent his four generals, and the ruler, represented by the small horn, which emerges from one of the four horns, represents Antiochus Epiphanes. So the vision has been literally fulfilled in history. Gabriel, by referencing the time of the end, is telling us, think, as, think in a different way, think uh, beyond that. It's the person here that I'm speaking about, this small horn in the vision, is a, is, is a type of somebody who's worse to come. He's, a, a, he's, he's foreshadowing that small horn of chapter 7 that's going to come from the Roman Empire. So, However, as we see here in, in Daniel 8, 17, Gabriel informs Daniel that the vision extends up to the end time, which refers to Daniel's 70th week, which is the last seven years of Israel's 490 prophetic years referred to in the prophecy of Daniel 9, 24 through 27, which we read. So therefore, this all indicates the vision was not only literally fulfilled in history by Antiochus, uh, by Medo Persia, Greece, Alexander, and his four generals, Antiochus Epiphanes IV, but it also foreshadows the character and actions of Antichrist during Daniel's 70th week, the time of the end. This is indicated by the fact that Rome, and in particular the final form of the Roman Empire, and not Greece and Middle Persia, is the empire that will exist during the 70th week of Daniel. Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 9, all tell us that preceding the second advent of Christ in his millennial reign, the Roman Empire will be on the world stage as a superpower. So, also further indicating that this is Gabriel that this is Gabriel's statement in verse 19, in which he tells Daniel that he will let him know what will occur at the latter time of wrath, for the vision pertains to the time of the end. Thus, Gabriel's telling us here in the church age, and those who'll be living during Daniel's 70th week, that the character and the actions of the small horn here in this vision in Daniel chapter 8 not only were fulfilled in history by Antiochus Epiphanes IV in the 2nd century BC, but they foreshadow the character and actions of Antichrist during Daniel's 70th week. He's a type of Antichrist, Antiochus is. What's a type? A signpost pointing to a future person or event or thing. Okay? For instance, 
The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus Christ is called the Lamb of God. The Lamb of the Old Testament is a type of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. That's, that's, that's an example of that, but in relation to Christ. So the Lamb of the Old Testament, that's why John, John the Baptist picked it up right off and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Those lambs uh, that we sacrifice are all a picture of Jesus. The true Lamb of God, the, the real deal. Jesus would be called the antitype, and the type is the lamb that was sacrificed in Israel on the Passover. So that's an example of type, antitype. This is what's going on here. Antiochus Epiphanes IV is a signpost pointing to a, a world ruler who's going to be wicked and do the same, similar things to what he did in the second century BC. Thus, Gabriel's telling us here in the church age and the believers living during Daniel's 70th week that the vision in Daniel chapter 8 foreshadows the events which will take place during the righteous indignation related to the end because it extends to an appointed time related to the end. The end and the appointed time related to the end are all speaking of Daniel's 70th week in which God will discipline Israel by exercising his righteous indignation towards Israel. Don't miss that. Why is Israel uh, uh, being disciplined? Because they rejected their Messiah. They rejected their Messiah. This, they're being disciplined. They're still being disciplined as we speak. They don't have their Messiah. They have seven, those seven more, we have seven more prophetic years of Israel's history left. But that can't happen until the church is out of the way in the rapture. Then Israel will be back on the time clock when Antichrist makes that treaty with Israel. That starts Daniel's 70th week. Then three and a half years into that comes Antichrist saying, I'm God. Goes and desecrates the temple. Abomination of desolation. Stops the sacrifice, says everybody worship me. War breaks out. That's the, that's the tribulation portion of Daniel's 70th week where there's a world war and you got Antichrist in the middle of it in the, in the Holy Land. So the small horn in Daniel chapter 8 represents Antiochus Epiphanes IV but foreshadows in many respects Antichrist. So there's a lot of things that they do. Uh, uh, look at uh, remember we studied in Daniel 9.27 Antichrist is going to set up an abomination of desolation that's the worship of himself we know that from what Paul says in 2 Thessalonians and, and also what Revelation says but uh, look at Daniel chapter 11 look at verse 21 because in Daniel 11.21 through uh, 30 what is it 35 in those verses it's all talking about Antiochus Epiphanes we're not done with him yet as I said before Look, it says in Daniel eleven twenty one. In his place, a, a despicable person will arise. That's Antiochus. On whom the honor of kingship had not been conferred. He took it by intrigue. But he will come in a time of tranquility and seize the kingdom by intrigue. The overflowing forces will be flooded away before him and shattered, and also the prince of the covenant. After an alliance is made with him, he will practice deception and he will go up and gain power with a small force of people. This is all uh, fulfilled in the second century BC. In a time of tranquility, he will enter the richest parts of the realm and he will accomplish what his fathers never did, nor his ancestors. And he, remember, he, his, his ancestors were Greek because he's Greek. He will distribute plunder and beauty and possessions among them and he will devise his schemes against strongholds, but only for a time. He will stir up his strength and courage against the king of the south, that's Egypt, with a large, king, a large army. So the king of the south will mobilize, Ptolemy, an extremely large and mighty army for war, but he will not stand, for schemes will be devised against him. Those who eat his choice food will destroy him, and his army will overflow, but many will fall slain, down slain. As for both kings, their hearts will be intent on evil, and they will speak lies to each other at the same table. This is all fulfilled in history. But it will not succeed, for the end is still to come at the appointed time. Then he will return to his land but with much plunder, but his heart will be set against the Holy Covenant. That's a reference to Jerusalem, Israel. And he will take action and then return to his own land. At the appointed time, he will return and come into the south, I Egypt. But this last time, it will not turn out the way it did before. For ships of Kittim, and that's a reference to the Romans when we get to it, because they, in history, turned, them, turned him back. They persuaded him not to go to Egypt. For ships of Kittim will come against him, Antiochus, and therefore he will be disheartened, and, this is, and he was very depressed about this. We know this from secular writings. And will return and become enraged at the Holy Covenant against the Jews and take action. So he will come back and show regard for those who forsake the Holy Covenant. 
Forces from him will arise, desecrate the sanctuary fortress, and do away with the regular sacrifice. This is what we read in chapter 8. And chapter 9 with Antichrist, yet future. And they will set up an abomination of desolation. Didn't we read abomination of desolation in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27? Two guys, different guys are, gonna, uh, are, are involved. Antiochus is the one involved here in chapter 11. Chapter 9, verse 27, that's Antichrist. So there's a lot of parallels between these two guys. And that's what Gabriel's trying to get us to understand in, in his references to the time of the end in chapter 8, verses 19 and 17. So I wanted to show you, that, see those, the abomination of desolation? I mean, keep reading it. It says, by smooth words. It's just like, this is what Antichrist will be. He'll be a very uh, uh, crafty individual and a, and a very violent person. And he'll be uh, successful militarily. By smooth words, he will turn to godlessness, those who act wickedly toward the covenant. But the people who know their God will display strength and take action. This will happen with the Jews during Daniel's 70th week as well. Those who have insight among the people will give understanding to the many. Yet they will fall by the sword and by flame and by captivity and by plunder for many days. Now when they fall, they will be granted a little help and many will join them in hypocrisy. Some of those who have insight will fall in order to refine, purge, and make them pure until the end time because it is still to come at the appointed time. So what we have here is a parallels between Antiochus Epiphanes IV and also Antichrist here through in those chapters. If you look, compare all these chapters, chapter 9, chapter 11, chapter 8, chapter 7, Revelations, another thing you can look at too. They're all telling us that Antich Antiochus Epiphanes IV in the 2nd century BC is foreshadowing Antichrist. Now let's, I want to bring out one more, th one more thing about Daniel 8.19 and it's about God's character and God's wrath. Look at Daniel 8.19, he says, in my translation, Daniel 8, 19, Then he said, Gabriel said to Daniel, Behold, I'm about, to, I'm about to cause you to know what will take place during the righteous indignation related to the end. I think the New American Standard translates it wrath, which is good. During the righteous, and the reason why I like righteous indignation, I think, no, the New American Standard says indignation. The reason why I like righteous indignation, because righteous indignation accurately describes God's wrath. God is, as we'll say, God doesn't get mad just for the sake of getting mad and, and, and getting hot-tempered like we can. When God gets angry, it's legitimate anger. When we get angry many times, you know, we get, we get mad at, you know, uh, you know, at people, it's usually not because we're concerned about God's holiness. We're concerned about that person made me mad. They did something that hurt me. So we, our anger many times, not all the time, is driven by our sin nature. Whereas... God is driven by his, his concern for his holiness. And this is what Jesus demonstrated when he was, he was angry at the fact that the temple was made a den of thieves, he called it. He was angry at that because the, t the temple was supposed to be a house of prayer and a communication of the word of God. That wasn't, go that, it, was made, it was made into a, a bazaar, a marketplace, you know, like a, a, you know, a, where um, people were, uh, like a place of business. And he was furious with that. He had every right to be angry. See, some people think that anger is always bad. Depends on what we're talking about here. If we're talking about righteous indignation, that's a good thing. For instance, you should be upset when you see some injustice like or a child being abused. You should be angry. There's something wrong with you if you're not. If you see something injustice on this you know, the corruption in the government. There's nothing wrong with being having this anger at that because we know that's wrong. It shows that you have, a, you have a, an awareness of what is right and what's wrong and justice, you know. And the more you grow and you learn about God and his plan for your life and we look at sin the way he looks at it and we look at rebellion the way he looks at it and disobedience, we'll start adopting his viewpoint and we'll be times where we'll have this righteous indignation. So and most times, I see most Christians, they don't have this righteous indignation because they're too immature and because they're too immature because uh, the, the, most of the times they're, they're, they're not concerned about defending God's holiness. They're more angry because somebody has done them wrong. And that's not right. I mean, we, you, you know, we're, we're all worried about ourselves and uh, retaliating and stuff. God's not, God, doesn't ret God doesn't retaliate like a human being does or something. He, he's, if he does any kind of retaliation for sin, 
He's justified. But many, what God does is he gives people grace because of his attribute of love. He gives them a he gives them ch- chance to change their tune before he does come down on them. That's how God is. He doesn't like to judge, but when he does, be watch out. Because God's wrath is a fire, as, we, as the book of Hebrews says. So what's this righteous indignation, or the indignation in, 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 in the New American Standard? It, the, the righteous indignation mentioned in Daniel 8.19 is a reference to God's wrath or righteous indignation towards the nation of Israel for rejecting her Messiah. We, I mean, now th- you might say, okay, why would God be angry with them? <laughs> look, 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 at, look at Daniel chapter 9. Daniel intercedes for the nation prior to his prayer, uh, and during his prayer, and the first thing he does is he intercedes for his people and he identifies with them and confesses all that they did against God. See, if God was right to go and, and uh, exile the Jews and destroy Jerusalem and kill thousands of people. God had righteous indignation, but he gave them every chance to turn it around and repent, and they wouldn't do it. And then he came down on them. And it's not what he wanted. But his righteous indignation is his legitimate anger towards sin and rebellion. God has every right to hold Israel accountable for they did. And you know, some people say, you know, they don't like this. It's not, even some Christians don't like this. The Jewish people are being punished they were punished for their rejection of the Messiah. People don't want to say that, but that's exactly what's happened. Remember they said, let our blood be on our heads and the children's heads? Well, that's happened. They were destroyed by Titus and the Roman armies. And what's happened? They've been out of their land for two centuries, not just so recently, 1948. That they, that they, and it was only because of what happened with the Holocaust. That they, 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 they were so much sympathy for the Jews that they got their land back. But yet they think they're, they, they don't realize it, unless they're looking at their, unless they're believers and Christians, that the worst time Hitler's going to make, Hitler's going to look like Mary Poppins considered next to Antichrist. They have worse coming and it's part of God's wrath and part of the wrath of God during the tribulation period, Daniel's 70th week, is so that the people, the Jews will repent he doesn't, he, he doesn't want to destroy them. If he, if he did, he would have destroyed them a long time ago with Moses. You know, with the Exodus generation. He would have destroyed, destroyed them out in the desert. So here's why God has righteous indignation, wrath toward Israel. Look what it says in Daniel 9.1. And the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of Median descent, who was made king over the kingdom of the Chaldeans. Same Darius of chapter 6 and chapter 5. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed in the books, that's the Old Testament uh, scriptures, the number of the years which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet for the completion of the desolations of Jerusalem. Namely, 70 years. That's the prophecy of Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah chapter 25, uh, verses 11 and 12. In fact, hold your place there for a second. Don't go there yet, but let me, I want to just make sure if it's there. Yeah. See if it's there because this is pretty. Okay, yeah. All right. Look at look at. Uh, look, I'll hold that for a second. Look at verse three. So I gave my attention to the Lord God to seek Him by prayer and supplications, with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Those are all expressions in, the, in, the, in Daniel's day, as we saw in the Book of Jonah, uh, of uh, repentance. God was, you know, his, I'm going to give you something funny about God. God's not waiting for the whole nation to r- repent. He's waiting for one guy to come forward and do the repentance for them, to intercede for them, is what he was doing here. Daniel was that guy. He was a man who was standing in the gap. Verse 4, I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed and said, Alas, O Lord, the great and awesome God, uh, it means the great one and the awesome one, who keeps his covenant with loving kindness, mercy, for tho- uh, uh, loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned. He didn't do it. They did it. But why is he doing this? Because he's identifying with his people and interceding for his people because he wants them back in the land. And he knows because Jeremiah prophecy says the 70 years in Babylon are pretty much up and he, he wants those people back in the land. And so does God. That's why God, the Holy Spirit's moving Daniel to make this prayer. So we have sinned. Look what he says. This is why God get as righteous indignation toward Israel during Daniel's day. We have sinned, committed iniquity, acted wickedly, 
and rebelled, even turning aside from your commandments and ordinances. Don't miss this. Moreover, we have not listened to your, pro your servants, the prophets. They killed them all. Jeremiah was... Oh, Jeremiah. They tried to kill Jeremiah. They exiled him to Egypt. I mean, this guy had a bad time. Read the book of Jeremiah, 52 chapters, and you won't feel like you had a bad life. This poor guy had a, bad, a tough time. Moreover, we have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name. That means by your authority. To our kings, our princes, our fathers, and all the people of the land. Notice that. Now you know why God was angry with Israel. Why he exiled them to Babylon. And he had every right to do that. And yet, he, over and over again, he sent them prophets. Hey, he sent them, he sent them, he sent them Isaiah. He, saw, he sent them Jeremiah. He sent all these guys. And they would not listen to these guys. The kings, every aspect of Israelite society is mentioned there in verse 6. They wouldn't listen to them. They wouldn't listen to the prophets of God. And you know what? Can I tell you something? The church is no different than Israel was. God sends men throughout the centuries teaching the word of God and they reject the word of God the church does. The majority in the church does not obey God just like Israel didn't obey God's word. The majority in the church throughout its history has not obeyed the word of God. They have not obeyed the men that have been sent to them. So then, it's, then it says in verse 7, Righteousness belongs to you, O Lord, but to us open shame, as it is this day, to the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, those who are nearby and those who are far away, and all the countries to which you have driven them because of their unfaithful deeds which you, they have committed against you. That's God's wrath against them. Open shame belongs to us, O Lord, to our kings and our princes and our fathers because we have sinned against you. So he talks about, we have sinned against you. And then it says, oh, look at this. He says in, uh, in verse 9, to the Lord our God belong compassion and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him. Not, nor have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his teachings, which he set before us through his servants, the prophets. Indeed, all Israel has, a, has transgressed your law and turned aside, not obeying your voice, so that the curse has been poured out on us along with the oath which is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, for we have sinned against him. Deuteronomy 27 talks about that. He says, that's what he's referencing. The law, Moses, before he departed, said, do this and live. Do this and this is what's going to happen to you. And it happened in history. It's happened throughout history where the Jewish people rejected the word of God and God exercised his righteous indignation and disciplined them severely, but only after, in grace and in love, he sent men the prophets over and over again say stop what you're doing repent confess your sins do what i tell you to do and no 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 stubborn obstinate kids then it says in verse 12 thus he has confirmed his words which he had spoken against us and against our rulers who ruled, uh, who ruled us to bring on us great calamity for under the whole heaven there has not been done anything like what has been done to jerusalem as it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come on us, yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord our God by turning from our iniquity and giving attention to your truth, the Bible, the word of God. Therefore the Lord has kept the calamity in store and brought it on us. That's the wrath that God exercised. For the Lord our God is righteous with respect to all his deeds which he has done, but we have not obeyed his voice. So you get the idea? God was angry with them. But God is not angry like a human gets angry. See, righteous indignation speaks of God's wrath, which is an expression of his holiness. The reason why he did what he did to Israel in Daniel's day is because he's holy. And God is also love. And if you reject his offer of grace, which flows from his attribute of love, there's only one thing left for you. Didn't Jesus say that in John 3? He who believes in me has eternal life. He who doesn't believe me, the wrath of God abides on him. So God doesn't want to judge. He's full of grace and mercy and love. But if there's a, a, God's not, uh, what's the word? God's not everlasting uh, uh, suffering, long suffering. He is, it's a time, there's a, is a, is a, is a, is a what did my parent, mother used to say? There's an end to my patience. Same holds true with God. So righteous indignation speaks of God's wrath, which is an expression of his holiness, 
referring to God's response to any thought, word, or action of his moral, rational creatures, whether mankind or angels, that is opposed to his holiness and manifests itself in actions that judge and punish the guilty. This is one of the reasons why uh, we have to go and confess our sins. It's insanity to say you don't have to confess your sins. Daniel, look at the Old Testament, look at the New Testament, confess your sins because God is holy. You don't want to confess your sins, you're going to face his wrath. And as a child of God, you're going to get disciplined. Do you like to get spanked? Your, your father take out the belt, you like that? Do you want God to take out the belt against you? Well, do it by don't confessing your sins. Be arrogant. And you know, woe to those men, who woe to them, who are teaching and leading God's people astray by teaching you don't have to confess your sins because now you're putting those people under discipline along with yourselves. And you can tell them, I said that. You can tell them I said that, those who are listening to me now. You run right to them and tell them I said that. God says, I've had enough of that stuff. Stop doing that. Don't teach you pe to lead people astray. God doesn't want to exercise his wrath against his people and discipline them. You have to confess your sins because God's holy. He's not going to sit there and let you be out of fellowship He's not going to keep that. He's not going to allow that to keep going. He's going to do something about it. He's going to take you out to the woodshed and spank you, little rear end, till you stop what you're doing, confess your sins, do what the Word of God says, and then obey Him. Don't follow the example of Israel. And I see a lot of my brothers and sisters in Christ who are doing the same thing that Israel did. The difference between righteous indignation and anger is that the former is based upon concern for the holiness of God, whereas the latter, listen to me, listen to what I just said. The difference between righteous indignation and anger is that the former is based upon concern for the holiness of God, whereas the latter, anger, is an emotional, selfish, self-centered, vindictive, and intent on harming another. God's righteous indignation is the legitimate anger towards evil and sin since legitimate anger towards evil and sin. Since both the contrary, sin is, and evil, both the contrary to his holiness or perfect character and nature. In fact, God's righteous indignation expresses his holiness. And today, we don't want to hear that in the church. We can't, we, we want to talk about the God of love. But nobody wants to hear that God's other side, wrath. He's holy. You don't mess with God. You don't, you don't sit there and contest God's patience. You don't put the Lord God to the test. You don't do that. Yet, we have no respect for God anymore. We don't even have respect for God in the church. You know, we come to, we come, some people, they come to some churches, and it's like they flip with God. You know, the people are talking. The, God's word is being taught, and you got people sitting there talking to each other. You know what I used to do with kids in the prep school when they did that? I'd throw a pencil off their head. They did that. I'd miss it, of course. What did I try to tell them? I tried to instill in those kids, you show respect for God's word when it's being taught. This is the holy word of God. Have respect for God. Just like you have respect for your parents, you have respect for God. How much more for God? And he, you have respect for him because he is holy. You don't mess with God. That's why when you sin, confess it. Don't put yourself in dis under discipline. Confess it. Do what he tells you to do. Yes, he gives you, you know, this is the, and this is the great thing about God. All those times Israel rejected him. And over and over, I used to sit there and go, you know, I know of a church that they've had several pastors that they ran out. And don't think it's the one I'm thinking. Several pastors that they've run out, church splits. Not one, not two, but three. They run these people out. And I always sat there and said, why does God not wipe the whole church out? Why does he allow them to keep going? It's because God is a God of grace. Thank God he is because you might need that grace if you go into apostasy. And he, and he, put, up and I, he put up and put up and sent another guy and they ran him out. Sent another guy and ran him out. Just like the prophets of Israel. God sent the prophets to Israel. That's why I say, all this stuff that's going on in churches today, and it's going on, especially in America, it's just, it's just, like, it's just like Israel, with the prophets. The same thing is going on. God's people never learn the lesson. The majority don't. So what we have here as we wrap this up,
and we need to wrap this up and go to our prayer meeting. Uh, uh, we need to see that uh, this vision and Daniel, this Daniel chapter eight, what Gabriel says in Daniel chapter eight, verse nineteen and seventeen, with the references to the to the vision being to the time of the end, extending to the time of the end, it's telling us that the vision is uh, that Antiochus Epiphanes not only f- uh, f- fulfilled it in the second century BC, but he's foreshadowing. Antichrist, who's going to do similar things and even worse things during Daniel's 70th week. And so hopefully you uh, uh, enjoyed that. We'll pick this up. We'll start really getting into the, we'll get into the, the interpretation uh, verses 20, 21, and 22 next week. Uh, remember, uh, this uh, Sunday we start 3rd John. We're doing an introduction to 3rd John. That's going to be a fun epistle, so hopefully you'll be with us on Sunday. Tiny little epistle, shortest, smallest epistle in the uh, New Testament. Boy, it packs a punch, though. You see, the, the apostle of love, John, uh, uh, fiery, the son of thunder himself, uh, furious with one of the pastors under his authority in Ephesus who wouldn't re- submit to his authority because he thought he was a big shot. And, well, this is going to be fun, fun epistle. You're going to enjoy it. Well, let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that the Holy Spirit would challenge us with what we've heard, encourage us, instruct us in righteousness, and rebuke us in, in right, as, as well, Father, in love. We know all the word of God does all those things. It reproves and rebukes, and it trains in righteousness and instructs. We just thank you, Father, for your word. And we pray that the Holy Spirit do a mighty work through your people and, and that you would result, and uh, this would all result in bringing glory to you and your Son. And all Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.